much. Hopefully, I know how to. Oops, no, wrong way. So, have you recently been asked to describe yourself in ten words or less, maybe a couple of sentences, in your application? Oh, okay. So, how many of you use the words nerd, uh, uncoordinated, uncreative? Any of you? No. But if you say you're a computer scientist or, or an engineer, that's basically what people think. <laughs> <laughs> they basically think that you have a uh, boring job, you work in a dingy office, um, you're boring, and uh, people don't naturally think that you're cool or uh, beautiful or fun, uh, which is sort of unfortunate because we need to attract a diverse group of people into engineering in order to have good problem solvers. I mean, it's known that if you have a diverse group of people working on problem solving, that you actually get better innovation. And so to dispel this rumor that you know, engineers are kind of nerdy, I'm going to start off by sharing with you some really cool engineers. So here's Ada Lovelace. Um, well, she's basically the first person who wrote code. And She's actually in everyone's presentation. She's from the 1800s, and she's quite pretty. She was a, uh, you know, the daughter of um, a famous poet. And uh, anyway, she was pretty for somebody of that era. Has anybody watched Mr. Bean? Yeah. Very, very funny. And you actually realize when you watch his shows that he actually does these great sort of engineering feats that are very, very humorous, right? Did you know that he's an electrical engineer? He got his master's at Oxford. <laughs> Electrical engineering, right? So, uh, anyway, I know he kind of looks like a nerd, so I'm not dispelling this rumor yet. So, <laughs> how about her? And a little more, uh, little more. She's a uh, famous actress, and uh, do you know that she was like a math prodigy? Do you guys have any smartphones in your pockets? Do you know that she uh, co invented the technology for uh, Bluetooth, Wi Fi, CDMA, uh, LT, and the Americans actually used her technology to control torpedoes in World War II. And in 2015, she was honored with uh, an inventor's, uh, in, in, in National Inventors Hall of Fame for her inventions. Isn't that amazing? So think about it. What's in your phone was invented by an actress that was born in the 1930s. Do you recognize this guy? Did you know that he studied? Uh, biochemical engineering at the University of Ohio. Of course, he got a little distracted by some underwear modeling, but uh, he, he went on to actually uh, have a very successful venture capital firm that actually invests in tech firms. Did you know that? Okay, how about this model? So she was, uh, Cindy's actually uh, listed in Forbes magazine as, uh, I think she was in 1995, as one of the highest paid models She's a very good businesswoman. She studied chemical engineering at Northwestern University in Illinois. Oops, I passed by him. He's not an underwear model. <laughs> but he's actually pretty cool because he was mayor. He's one of the richest men in the world. He studied electrical engineering at Johns Hopkins. He can fly a helicopter and a plane, and he's done a lot for mankind. You recognize her? Where's the mayor? So she's actually uh, had two degrees from Stanford, and she was the first female engineer hired at Google, and she's responsible, supposedly responsible for that very clean look that Google has. Anyway, she is currently the CEO of Yahoo, and she's been uh, listed as the 16th most powerful woman in business, listed on the 40 under 40, and she's caused quite a controversy when she posed for uh, Vogue magazine uh, when she first became CEO. But anyway, these are great role models, and uh, they've done really interesting things. So they're, they're not really boring or unattractive. They're pretty interesting people. And so we have to do a better job of getting the word out. Now, my next phase is going to uh, share with you the etymology of the word engineering. And so, of course, the word engine, that doesn't really help you uh, get that nerdy thing going, getting out of there. But ingenious does. And did you know that the Latin word for engineering is derived from the word to create? Did you know that? So it's actually a creative discipline, so it's really not that nerdy, right? And then the accreditation board that uh, gives accreditation to most universities has a definition of engineering. And did you know that it, it's 
The definition is the application of math and science for the benefit of mankind. I mean, that's why I chose electrical engineering and computer science, because I thought it was actually a creative uh, major for the benefit where you could go out and change the world. What do you think about that? Do they, does it sound less nerdy now? Yeah. Okay, we're getting there. So I went to an all-girls high school. Uh, it was a, an elite all-girls high school in Greenwich, Connecticut. And most of the girls at my school would go on to uh, very well-known uh, top uh, liberal arts schools. And so I did all the typical things. I was really good at writing and pursued art and math. I was a uh, big photographer, did calligraphy. And so it was no surprise my senior year I was voted most likely to become a photographer. But what was a surprise was when I announced to my advisor, Sister McLaughlin, that I wanted to be an engineer. Uh, because clearly, she felt that I was not prepared and I was gonna be a total failure and I would not go on to one of these wonderful liberal arts schools. So the first thing she did is she called in my math teacher, uh, Sister Kane, who was very, very stern. And she sat down with me and she said, we're totally unprepared for engineering. And she began with uh, telling me that all the physics problems I'd ever solved were perfect in that there were 30 or 40 degree multiples and that I hadn't even dealt with the coefficient of friction mu or any of the other Greek variables that intimidate students early on. And so uh, I, I was glad she gave me that message because I knew I had to work really hard and I developed a certain level of resilience. Um, but then the next person she called in was my dad. And my dad's response was, if she fails out, then she'd do something else. And I didn't, mean, well that's not gonna happen, right? And the next person was my mom, and of course she didn't want me to be a computer scientist or electrical engineer, and she decided that I should be an attorney. And the reason why she wanted me to be an attorney was because she felt that whatever I did, it would be useful. Now it's sort of funny, because that's the way I think about computer science and electrical engineering, right? So now you're probably wondering how I actually decided to be an engineer. Well, in my day, we actually didn't have you know, Scratch or any of those other wonderful programs online. We actually didn't have the internet then, and so I actually had to go to a local school a local college that has a computer. And so one of my favorite things to do was actually to draw pictures. And they're probably not very impressive, but in my day, we didn't really have desktop publishing. So I would spend a lot of time because you know you would have to like line up all the characters and you have to choose the characters to get the right effect. And then you have to run the program to see what it would look like and then just fix everything and run it again. So I actually thought of computer science electrical engineering as a very, very creative major, right? Um, I mean, I did some of the business programs that you typically do, but it was the artistic side that actually made me feel that computer science electrical engineering was so cool. And so I went on, I wanted to learn how the you know, silicon chips worked, I wanted to know how the display worked, I wanted to know how uh, data was, uh, communications worked and how programs were architected, and so that was the beginning of my career. I was also influenced by television. I actually watched too much television because my mom actually thought that I should learn Spanish before I went to school and I didn't know any English when I got to school. So uh, I actually learned English on television and I watched a lot of these great programs. And has anybody ever watched Lost in Space? A, a few of you have. Well anyway, there was this great robot and he had the greatest personality. He would say, he does not compute. He would say, Danger Will Robinson. And everybody wore these cool little outfits. It was really cute. And then, um, <laughs> In Star Trek, you've all seen Star Trek, right? Did you ever notice that there are all these smart tablets? I mean, I chose the, the image on the bottom because there are all these cool smart tablets and sensors. I actually think that I'm not the only person in tech that was influenced by Star Trek. What do you think? <laughs> so one of my favorite, favorite books is a, a book by uh, Crockett Johnson from the 1950, for 1955. Do you know Harold the Movable Crayon? Yes. yes. Anyway, so I love him because he is like the most amazing problem solver, and he's always on this journey with this magic purple crayon. And all the books always start off with, you know, one night, Harold decides to take a walk, right? <laughs> and so immediately he ends up up in the sky or in some dangerous situation, and he magically, he's like the fastest problem solver you could ever meet. And he quickly creates a solution. In this particular scenario, he creates a balloon. Because if he doesn't create a balloon, he's gonna go splat and fall on the floor and die and the book will be over, right? <laughs> it's kind of like an entrepreneur, but with the purple crayon. And so I actually like to think of computer science and problem solving kind of like, you know, Harold and the purple crayon and you know his creative problem solving skills. So in one of my crazy moments, I actually took up this work, skeletons, part of the bobsled team. And the funny thing about it is, does anybody here know what that sport is? Skeleton? It's kind of like you go down a fifth. Well, anyway, it's um, it's a crazy sport. It's just recently been in the Olympics, and 
you go down an ice chute at uh, 80 miles an hour, and the, uh, it's, it's, uh, the mile, it's about a mile uh, of a track. And so it sounds like a physics problem, doesn't it? Yeah. Well, so I actually thought so too, and I thought that being an engineer, I would be a really good athlete. So it's nice how you could get that confidence from being an engineer. But anyway, um, so, uh, and, and the reason why I thought that was in 1932, the two-man U.S. bobsled team felt the same way, and they realized Remember that little coefficient of friction that I talked about before? They actually realized that if they heated up the runners with a blowtorch, that they'd go down that little chute faster. And of course they did, and they won, right? And then in 1952, the uh, Germans decided that if they got the biggest team they could actually find, that they would put so much weight on the sled that they would go down faster than anybody else, and they won, right? So now the US Boston Federation has actually you know, modified the rules so that you can do these little physics tricks, but it didn't matter. I actually thought that as an engineer, I'd be a really good athlete. And so um, that sort of delusion allowed me to kind of win some competitions and have a good time. So um, I would actually say, since we're talking about the tipping point, the tipping point in my career was when I went to get my second master's at the MIT Media Lab, which is a magical place. I mean, have you guys heard of the MIT Media Lab? Um, it's, uh, it's definitely a place where, uh, you know, Nick was certified, he really talked about the future in these TED Talks, uh, you know, 20 years ago, well, years before I arrived. But well, I was really, really fortunate because I was actually at the Media Lab uh, right at the time interactive television and the internet, as we know today, was being born. And so I got to explore interactive storytelling. I actually got to explore what it was like to tell a story for an athlete during an event. Actually, that's actually more like a gaming uh, research, but, um, you know, I felt that just watching television was, wasn't as much fun as actually playing. And I get to participate in creating this in massive, immersive 3D space with my, uh, my advisor, Gloriana Davenport. Uh, and in that day, most computing actually took place on a, on a terminal. What we actually did was we created sensors and we put displays and we created these sort of interactive modules so people going through this space would be communicating by these different activities they would do. I graduated, I got to go out and be part of this whole in, you know, internet explosion. I was on the founding team of the first consumer magazines. Yeah, I know, it's the prehistoric days. I, somebody asked me if they even had computers, and they did. That was the early 90s. And then um, I went on to Disney. I got to work on the first Oscars, one of the first Oscars websites. Actually, Billy Crystal was at the uh, podium during, um, you know, during that uh, Oscar, and he was the MC. And I remember he joked about how the um, website had gone down. And I thought to myself, oh my gosh, I'm going to be fired, right? But he's just joking, so uh, it took me a long time. <laughs> um, and then I got to do what everybody dreams about, or dreamt about doing during the dot-com days. I, I was part of a team that launched a company called One Man. We grew to be the 10th largest. We had a fabulous IPO. And I got to grow these geographic communities with local content you know, way before it's done. I mean, Yelp and all those other companies weren't around then. It was profitable the moment we uh, launched it. So it was actually a really exciting time. But all this was actually made possible because I was an engineer and I knew how to build things. And so these things really didn't exist beforehand. It was about you know, having the tools and having the skills and trying to imagine you know, the future and, and having the skills to be able to do that. So I would actually say that you know, we've sort of reached the tipping point in terms of how people understand the opportunities if you're a computer scientist. And I'd actually even go as far as to say that you know, all these uh, classes and online programs to teach kids how to code are actually reaching the tipping point. Unfortunately, if you look at the numbers, the numbers for women in computer science, the percentage of women in computer science, still not looking so great. I mean, if you look over the past couple of decades, they're just getting worse. And what's kind of interesting is that if you only have 18% of the graduates as women, right, and then only 11% of them go into tech companies, how could you expect the senior executives to look any different? I mean, you're not gonna have diversity, right? So, but the thing that's kind of interesting is that the programs that are working focus on problem solving, which is kind of interesting, right? And those are the ones that seem to attract both diverse groups of people as well as women. And one of the things that we've learned is that when you have a diverse group of people focused on problem solving, you get more interesting solutions, a lot of innovation. So when I started Dream the Code at Women, I decided to focus on problem solving. And Dream and Code Women is a, uh, a, a, it's kind of a creative coding competition, but the focus is solving an interesting problem. So first the students have to pick an interesting problem, which is really hard, and then they have to solve it. And both of those things are a lot harder than coding, I, I admit that. And so 
uh, the kids who are selected by really hundreds of kids that, that submit, and then a, a team of judges will select the finalists, and then they're invited into a stage with about 600 people in the audience, you know, stri uh, live streaming, and these children come on and they share their creations, and then on the stage we have uh, people who are very, very successful entrepreneurs and, and computer scientists that give these really meaningful prizes like big checks, $20,000, or um, you know, give them uh, internships. And so what's really kind of amazing is that it's not just impactful to the people who win, but the people who sit in the audience and didn't have the courage to actually submit, they start thinking, I could do this, right? Uh, we had 50% female participation both in uh, 2014 and this year. In 2014, four teams were, uh, four companies were started, and two of them got funding. And those two companies that got funding were students from Stuyvesant, from this school. Um, this is an example of a, of a submission, and this, this girl, Maya, actually won the Trinity Street High, High School Prize. She actually created, for less than $500 using Arduino, a device that actually detects respiratory diseases, because she figured out that uh, the number of people with respiratory diseases in the, in the world are growing, and she wanted to be able to create a, a device, an expensive device, that would be able to detect uh, breathing patterns that look like they uh, belong to a person who has uh, respiratory disease so that they could get help. And then we also had another uh, a college team. Um, they actually created a virtual reality system that allowed uh, their patients who had gone through a traumatic situation to learn to react to fear in a different way. But one of the things that I did learn from this competition, um, because when I first announced that it was about creatively solving problems, um, solving problems is actually really, really hard. Because the first thing you have to do is identify a problem, right? And that takes both sides of the brain. Then after you identify the problem you want to solve, you basically have to start coming up with ideas, and that requires you to use the right side of the brain, be creative and you know, expanding ideas. The next thing you have to do is select an idea, and that's left side. You have to you know, pare that down. And then you have to execute, right? And so that uses all parts of the brain. And so that's why we encourage kids to find a team of people that have all of these skills, because it enables them to do better problem solving. And as I said, diversity helps students, and helps actually create, uh, solve more interesting problems. So, did anybody ever heard to hear the word solutionist? No, right? No. Well, has anybody heard of the IEEE? So, IEEE is a standards organization for the Institute of Electronic and, Electric and Electrical Engineering, and they actually create a lot of really important standards. But what's really interesting is they actually have a title for something that's called a solutionist. And a solutionist is actually an engineer that uses their trade to solve problems. And the reason why this is important is because if you're able to solve problems, you're able to create opportunities. So somebody who actually can solve a problem for a potential employer can actually get a job, right? And somebody who actually can solve problems for their customers can start a company and they can get, uh, you know, and then they can create jobs and, um, and then if you're, Anyway, if we teach students how to solve problems, then in the end, we'll have a better world because there are less problems out there. So anyway, um, so do we think that being a solutionist sounds better than being an engineer? I mean, you have to be an engineer first, but you end up being able to uh, solve problems, and that's a cool thing as well. So if somebody were to ask me today you know, to describe myself, I think I would say I was a solutionist. Thank you very much.